question. Uh, members of the Board of Trustees Committee on Fiscal Affairs, please respond <clears throat> present when you hear your name. Chairperson Ferrer. Here. Vice Chairperson Mojica may be on the phone, but it might be absent and excused. He's in transit. Trustee Sunshine. Sorry, I'm mute. It's Robert. I'm here. Oh, great. Hey, Robert. Um, Trustee Sunshine. Okay, Trustee Berger. Present. Trustee Cortez Vasquez. Okay, I see her saying it, but I, it's fine. Trustee Thompson. Present. Uh, Professor Verzani, the faculty rep. Present. Excellent. Professor Ned Benton, who's the faculty alternate. Present. Alexis Fisher, the student representative, welcome. Great, you're muted too, but I see you. I got you. Okay, and Nicole Agu, the student alternate, also welcome to you. Present. Great. Uh, Trustee Picant. Present. Great, and Trustee Burke. Present. Terrific. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, this public meeting of the Committee on um, uh, Finan uh, Financial Affairs is now called to order. On March 7, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202, declaring a state of emergency in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. On March 13, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202.1, which included a suspension of law allowing the attendance of meetings telephonically or other similar service. Article seven of the public officer's law to the extent necessary to permit any public body to meet and take such actions authorized by law without permitting public in-person access to meetings and authorizing such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service provided that the public has the ability to view and listen to such proceedings and that such meetings are recorded later transcribed, as will this. Um, in accordance with the executive order, this board meeting is being held via video conference with a live stream found at the CUNY Board of Trustees website. We're also testing our new closed captioning feature today which you can see at the bottom of your screen. A copy of the agenda, the calendar, is uh, also available online at the CUNY Board of Trustees website. Additional items may be added during the meeting. As a reminder, please mute your audio so that we can ensure that everyone can hear. Now I'd like to ask the secretary to take a roll call for members of the chancellor's office and any other invited guests. Great, thank you. So members of the chancellery and other invited guests, please respond present. When you hear your name, Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez. Present. Excellent. General Counsel and Senior Vice Chancellor for Legal Affairs, Derek Davis. Present. Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost, Jose Luis Cruz. Present. Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, Hector Batista. Present. Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapienza. Present. Vice Chancellor Brian Cohn. Present. Excellent. Uh, President Carol Mason. Okay. Uh, Christina Chiapa. Present. Present. Great. Uh, and then um, Martin Sterla. Present. And we have invited guests from Gartner, Stephen Kaplan, who's the senior managing partner. Present. Excellent. And Robert Yankello, who's a senior director uh, analyst. Present. Great. That's everybody. Thank you, Gail. Now let's turn to the items requiring a vote today. Given that all board members are participating remotely via Zoom and we're unable to, we're unable to see everyone all at once, 
I'll announce the resolutions and ask for members to respond only if you'd like to abstain or oppose an item. Otherwise, your vote will be recorded as a yes. If you are voting no or abstaining, please state your name and vote. Additionally, if you wish to uh, second an item or have any questions, please state your name first for the record. And let's try to avoid speaking over one another. Uh, we'll take up the following item for approval. Action item 1A is the approval of the minutes of the October 5th, 2020 meeting. Um, I move the approval of action item 1A. Is there a second? Berger, second. Is there, thank you, Henry. Is there any, um, um, is there any uh, um, discussion on this? Any additions or corrections? Hearing none, uh, please respond if you'd like, only if you'd like to abstain or oppose. The minutes are adopted. Um, now I'd like to address section two. Policy item 2A is a resolution requesting the authorization of a contract with MathWorks for mathematical computing software. The university currently has an enterprise license with MathWorks for the mathematical computing software products, MATLAB and Simulink, um, which uh, are used throughout the university for a wide variety of academic disciplines, including engineering, computational biology, business, medicine, social sciences, data science, robotics, machine learning, and signal processing. The software provides CUNY's faculty, students, and researchers with the experience of using a variety of products that are compatible with online training sources. The existing contract with MathWorks is set to expire uh, on November 30, 2020, and the university is seeking approval for a new license with MathWorks Enterprise for MATLAB and Simulink for three years with an option to renew for um, two additional years and one year terms for, for two and an additional one year term uh, for a total cost of uh, $1,197,181. Now I'd like to ask uh, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Jose Luis Cruz to uh, provide further background on this item. Thank you, Trustee Ferrer, and good afternoon to all of the trustees and invited guests. Um, the MathWorks for Mathematical Computing software consists of a suite of over 50 products associated with the MATLAB and Simulink platforms. Uh, these are industry standard, best of breed platforms in science, math, and engineering programs. They're much like uh, the Adobe Creative Suite for the creative arts and AutoCAD, uh, what AutoCAD is to industrial design. Uh, for years, these platforms have been deeply ingrained in many of our academic programs and research projects. In fact, MATLAB was a tool of choice in my doctoral dissertation many years ago and a tool that I would use uh, as a teacher in my engineering courses at the University of Puerto Rico. The widespread use of these tools among our campuses um, was what originally led to the realization that a system-wide enterprise agreement uh, would reap uh, economies of scale. And a recent consultation of our campus provost yielded uh, strong support to maintaining the enterprise license for these tools. Uh, so I would uh, add my uh, recommendation to the board for its consideration of extending this contract. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I'll move approval of, uh, of item 2A. Do I have a second? Erger, second. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? I'd like to make a comment. Yes. I, I completely concur with the provost. Uh, we've been using MATLAB at CSI since I arrived in the mid nineties. Uh, I currently use an OER alternative, but um, the ability for running um, MATLAB through the internet has been a godsend for continuity of our classes uh, since we went remote. It, it, it needs to be emphasized that these tools being available to the students from their home is, is essential. 
Um, just one question, if I may, is how do we lobby for other math specific software to be uh, included in site licenses? It, it, I've been asking other people and I can't get an answer. So I thought I'd go to the top. Well, will the top please give an answer? <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, I, will, I will say that uh, of course, there's always a, a connection between trustees and and faculty members that serve on the board to uh, contact me directly. If you have questions about academic technology, um, we would likely refer it to the Committee on Academic Technology that has representation from our 25 campuses. And that's how organically we uh, receive recommendations for uh, the consideration of, of system-wide uh, licenses. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this motion? If there is no one else, we'll now vote. Please only respond if you would like to abstain or oppose. Item 2A is unanimously approved. I just want uh, to uh, acknowledge that Ken Sunshine joined. So for voting purposes, Ken was present. So hi, Trustee Sunshine. Uh, I need, an assi I, I need an assistant badly to get on these Zoom calls, but I got on. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Glad to have you on. Um, policy item 2B is a resolution requesting the authorization of a contract with Turnitin for plagiarism detection software. To ensure academic integrity, CUNY's colleges require plagiarism detection software to confirm that students are submitting original work for their class assignments. In 2015, CUNY began to utilize Turnitin, a cloud technology solution based on its ability to meet the needs of a large complex higher, edu large complex higher education institutions for its unique features and its capability to integrate with Blackboard and other learning management systems. To date, the Turnitin soft software has continued to operate successfully. One of the software proprietary features includes the ability to search the internet to find potential acts of plagiarism and compare submitted papers to a database of more than 1.2 billion previous papers and 170 million articles. Also, the license includes a Turnitin peer review tool peer mark and proprietary online grading tools that can be used by CUNY faculty. The university's current contract with Turnitin expired on November 11, and the university is seeking approval to extend the contract for three years with an option to renew for two additional ones, for two additional one-year terms for a total cost of $1.985 million. I will now ask uh, once again, um, University Provost Jose Luis Cruz to provide further background. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as in the case for the MATLAB and Simulink uh, tools that we just discussed, Turnitin is an industry standard, best of breed platform that in recent years has been widely adopted by higher ed and K-12 schools and systems. Um, I myself have been exposed to it, not only at Lehman College and CUNY, but also at the California State University system. And those of you who know me know I have five kids. They've all used it in K-12 as well. Um, in 2015, Turnitin uh, was recommended uh, by the University Committee on Academic Technology to the previous question about how these recommendations um, uh, come to eventually to consideration of the board um, to replace um, a standalone tool uh, already integrated with Blackboard that was not as scalable, did not offer the types of features our faculty required and was not as readily integrated to our systems. Um, a recent consultation with Campus Provost yielded support to maintaining the enterprise license tool um, as requested through this resolution. And I would add uh, my voice of support to, to that. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Is there uh, anyone who, uh, oh, well, uh, let me just move approval of uh, 2B. Do I have a second? Berger, second. Okay, um, are there any, uh, is there any discussion on, uh, on this? Trustee Piquot has a question. 
Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Provost Cruz, I know that the university is not moving forward with Proctor Track, um, the proctoring service that we were formerly going to use. I just wanted to know, are there any discussion in regards to new proctoring services that you all are looking at uh, to be utilized in the future? Sure. So regarding proctoring services, we have a group that's led by our colleagues in CIS, uh, who is also in consultation with SUNY because they themselves are exploring options. And so right now, what I can say is that um, there's work uh, evaluation of tools that could be integrated for use in the spring. And uh, the emphasis is on uh, tools that uh, provide the adequate level of, of proctoring with the minimum amount of intrusiveness uh, into our students. Uh, so, that's, so those are the guiding principles uh, for that evaluation effort. Thank you. Is there any other comment? Hearing none, we'll now vote. Uh, please only respond once again if you would like to abstain or oppose. Item 2B is approved unanimously. Thank you very much, Provost. Thank you. And now we're on to. Uh, um, Information items. Um, item 3A is the future of CUNY's informational tech, information technology systems. We now call on Executive Vice Chancellor Hector Batista to provide a brief introduction before handing the floor over to uh, our consultant, Gartner, uh, who has prepared a presentation on that topic. Executive Vice Chancellor Batista. Thank you, Trustee Ferrer, and good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you for placing this important topic on the agenda and making it one of the priorities of the committee and the board. As the board members may recall, in late spring, both Chairman Thompson and Trustee Ferrer asked us to refresh a report developed by Garner to include the most updated technology offerings available and to update the board on recent efforts, even through this COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm happy to be here today with members of the Gardner team, University CIO Brian Cohen. As you know, technology moves quickly and we must also move quickly to explore more systems that offer best features, enhancing functions, improving user experience that can easily upgrade the meet and meet the outgoing needs of CUNY. CUNY must also leverage the benefit that the cloud technology has to offer. We need to be flexible, we have to be simplify system support and administration. We should empower our end users and provide them with access to the latest enhancement and innovation available. Cloud-based technologies are key enabler to these needs. It also is the key to achieving our vision for the next generation of technology systems. Now, I'm, now I would like to turn it over to Garner. Garner has been working with, uh, with my office to look at a cloud strategy. They have cloud first and mind, mindset when considering our technology solutions. Over the last five years, this principle has been applied to many of the systems that we have procured at the university. Now I'd like to turn it over to Consultant of Ghana to present a refreshed CUNY first modernization report and how we at the university are gonna go from where we currently are to a cloud-based solution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Executive uh, Vice Chancellor Batista. And thank you committee members for inviting us today. My name is Steve Kaplan. I am a senior managing partner at Gartner Consulting. I oversee all of the consulting work we do for our education clients in North America. And as a New York City based consultant, I've also worked on several of the projects that we have done for the City University of New York over the years. And we're honored to be asked to advise you guys uh, in general and to be here this afternoon, Bob. Hello, my name is Bob Yankello. I'm a senior director analyst at Gartner. I've been here about four years. And prior to that, I spent 28 years in higher education, uh, the last 17 of which were in technology. I cover systems, administrative systems, cloud systems, and strategic planning and support in those areas and work collaboratively with Steve. Thank you for having us today. And before I start, just confirmation that folks can see the, uh, the presentation material. Yes. Yes. Great, great, yes. thank you. Okay, 
Um, so the, just as background, uh, the impetus for this uh, analysis was a question that was raised at the uh, April committee meeting, which was, when will CUNY first be moved to the cloud and how much will it cost? And that was the focus of, of our analysis. In order to provide a meaningful answer to that, uh, we first wanna make sure that we've got a common understanding of background and some key definitions. Uh, we want to paint a picture of what that move to next generation administrative systems in the cloud looks like. So we have a basis for a plan and a cost estimate. Then we'll discuss the roadmap itself, which is the schedule for moving administrative systems to the cloud. Uh, we'll look at the cost estimate and then at the end, we'll touch on some next steps, which you know, we think are very important to position the university for success in this effort. I'll, I'll notice that note, uh, note that there's a lot of material in this report and we're not gonna go over all of it today, but it's all in the, the information that has been given to the committee. We've created this uh, analysis by gathering input from uh, CIS, as well as from a variety of users across the university, both at individual schools and at the system central office. Uh, we've leveraged Gartner Research as represented by, by Bob here, uh, research analysis on higher education trends, research analysis on the ERP marketplace and the evolution of cloud technologies. We've also leveraged our own consulting experience, both directly with the university, our experience with other institutions in ERP and uh, other cloud projects, as well as previous work that we've done with the city and state. The business context for this discussion about moving CUNY's administrative systems to the cloud is driven by this need to improve the student experience, better manage resources and make informed decision making, which is a set of objectives that one way or another, all the institutions that we work with are pursuing. And as part of that effort, many institutions are modernizing their administrative systems, their ERP, replacing some components and renovating others and moving in a phased manner uh, to uh, modern, more modern systems that are typically hosted in the cloud. Um, we'll talk about the schedule for this, but it's important to note that the actual cost and timing will depend upon CUNY decisions and commitments that are made now and that are made ongoing during the uh, implementation project. Also by way of background, how did we get to this point in the journey with CUNY's administrative systems? Uh, as a reminder, uh, it started with uh, custom-built systems for finance and HR, and custom-built separate, 23 separate custom-built systems for student information at each of the CUNY colleges. In 2005, CUNY decided to consolidate all of that on a single uh, software platform, including combining all the college student information systems into a single shared student information systems. At the time, that was a very uh, progressive choice that CUNY made, and even today, that remains a unique uh, characteristic of the CUNY First system. Most of the other systems we work with, each school within the system has their own student information system. Uh, what that means is that as vendors encounter CUNY, they're going to see a more complex set of requirements than they would encounter as they work with some of their other university clients. So the implementation of that migration from uh, 23 separate systems to a single system uh, took place over the period 2007 to 2014. Recently, CUNY has been upgrading CUNY First to the most recent version of PeopleSoft. This upgrade provides the university with new capabilities. It enhances the uh, user's experience, and it also ensures that the CUNY First system will be able to support the university for the years to come as you embark on your phased migration to your next generation, which is that cloud, that software as a service solutions, cloud-based ERP software. Now, the word cloud gets used an awful lot, and honestly, it has different meanings to different um, parties. So we thought we'd just make sure for the purpose of today's discussion, when we say cloud, what we're talking about is using commercially available software as a service solutions running in the public cloud to perform those key finance, HR, and student administration functions. It's recognized that that core system based in the cloud will be supplemented by other uh, point solutions, which may be cloud-based or not uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And one of the outcomes of moving to this new platform is the eventual sunset of the on-premise PeopleSoft software that you guys are using now. We also just like to note that when enterprises move to the cloud, they do so, as we said, in a phased fashion. 
Um, they follow a variety of patterns in term of, terms of time, and they also follow a variety of strategies. Uh, I'll, I'll note that uh, CUNY is not at the origin on this graph. Uh, there are CUNY systems in the cloud as uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Batista mentioned, and there are components of the CUNY First ecosystem that are running in the cloud today. So this, uh, this effort that we're gonna be discussing is really a continuation of something that's already begun. Uh, as I mentioned, there are several different strategies for moving to the cloud. And the strategy that the City University of New York has chosen is what's called cloud first. And I won't go into all the details on it, but I will say that this is very common. By far and away, the cloud first approach is what we see at the other institutions we're working with. And frankly, it's probably the most common across all all industries and all of our clients. So what do we mean when we say moving CUNY, CUNY's administrative systems to the cloud? Well, this is a vision statement that uh, kind of identifies that at a very high level. By 2031, the next generation systems will include a core set of software as a service solutions that meet the university's needs are integrated with the rest of CUNY's uh, technology environment. In order to, um, or making the design decisions that will follow from this vision statement, CUNY will be following a set of guiding principles. And the first is that whatever solution is, is selected and implemented must meet the university's requirements, which as I mentioned earlier, are, are kind of distinctive because CUNY is running the whole system on a single platform. Uh, the solution will run in the cloud, it will integrate with the CUNY ecosystem, It'll be recognized that this administrative system will be the system of record for a number of important data domains within the university. It will be open to point solutions to enhance functionality as appropriate. It'll support mobile technology so it can be accessed through phones and tablets as well as conventional computers. And where possible, the university will seek to use software suites from one or a few set of vendors uh, to provide as much functionality as possible. What the university is likely to end up with at a very high level architecture is something that's gonna look like this, where we have this core set of finance, student and HR solutions running the software as a service. Uh, up, up, up top, they're integrated with a mix of point solutions, some of which are software as a service and some of which are, are on-premise. And all of this will be supported by the university's evolving technology ecosystem, which as as just as the administrative systems are moving to the cloud, gradually the rest of the CUNY first infra the CUNY infrastructure is going to be moving to the cloud. So the migration of the administrative systems, while it's the focus of today's discussion, is part of a larger migration for the university of its technology infrastructure, as well as other applications like learning management, CRM, et cetera. So if this is the vision, for what, what it means to move CUNY first administrative systems to the cloud, how long will that take? Here is a proposed timeline that you know, we think is feasible. I'll, I'll point out at the top, in parallel with the modernization activities, there'll be ongoing work to upgrade and operate and maintain CUNY first. And as you'll see from those white triangles, that includes a number of enhancements to CUNY first, which are planned or already underway so that even while the university is waiting for the new technology, they'll continue to see improvements in the existing platform. The light blue boxes represent some prerequisite activities that we think it's very important that CUNY undertake prior to starting their migration to uh, software as a service solutions. And then the dark blue uh, bars, which represent the work that we're going to be estimating are the core activities to move to new administrative systems platform. Now it's articulated here as four bars, but in reality, it's gonna be a phased implementation with functionality rolling out gradually over time, starting with the first pieces of HR and uh, time and attendance and payroll, uh, which right now we're, we're forecasting could be in the mid, mid 2024, the rest of finance and HR being completed and up and running by the end of 2025, the first Universe, the first it school or set of schools moving to uh, the new student information system will occur during 2026. And then the rest of the schools within the university will be rolling on to that new, um, 
that new platform over the course of 2026 through 2028. So by the time we get to 2028, all parts of the university are up and running on the new system and you can completely shut down the old people soft software. I know this was one of the um, fundamental questions that had been asked that we were asked to address the timing. So I'll just pause here. Uh, do you guys wanna ask questions now or should we continue and then do questions at the end? Well, why don't we, uh, why don't we hold our questions till the end just make note of them so that we're, you know, we have a full picture of what we're doing. Thank you, Trustee Ferrer. So this is the proposed schedule, as I said, running through 2028. In order for the university to be able to achieve that schedule, it's going to have to pay attention to some important critical success factors, uh, most of which, but not all, are in the university's control. It's going to be critical that the staffing and the funding and the resources that the program requires are available throughout the life of the effort, uh, which means maintaining this as a priority for the university. It's going to be critically important that the university begins now, and we'll repeat this a little bit later, but begins addressing process simplification and re-engineering. Uh, in some ways, the cloud-based uh, solutions are more flexible, but in some ways less flexible. And in order to have a successful migration to those, uh, to those products, it's gonna be important that the university has business processes that are as simple as possible. So that act activity needs to begin even before you start the actual migration. Governance and design and decision-making are gonna be critical to keep the project moving quickly. Also following what we recommend is a, a you know, accelerated uh, decision-making techniques like what we call answer first in order to, uh, in order to accelerate the schedule. Moving to cloud technology will significantly change the balance of responsibilities between the users and the super users, between the user community and what the technology folks do. And across all of those uh, groups of, of, of CUNY staff, there will need to be new skills developed and new training available. And in order to get the entire university to participate in, in this process, including the process simplification, we think it's very important that even though we're talking about ERP today, when the project is actually rolled out to the university, it is not positioned as a technology project, but it is positioned as a transformative effort to um, mod modernize CUNY's administrative systems to improve services to students, faculty, and staff. It's that perspective of you know, the output of the result, which the output of the project, which is the services, rather than the internal aspect, which is the software, that successfully motivates and engages the university to participate in successful effort. There are also two critical success factors interrelated that are outside of the university's uh, immediate control that need to be kept an eye on. And the first is the availability of a student solution. The marketplace for cloud administrative software is evolving. Uh, finance and human resources solutions are pretty mature, but the market for student information systems is still maturing. And as we sit here today, uh, we do not see any offering in the marketplace that could right now satisfy CUNY's needs. The, the major players in the market are, are mod, mom, maturing their products quickly, and it's not unreasonable to expect that they'll have something ready by the time this schedule would need it, which would be in 2025. So that's likely, but by no means guaranteed. And that availability of student software will affect how the university takes advantage of administrative software suites. In the ideal world, you'd like to get your finance HR and student all from the same vendor but you may find yourself in a situation where one of the options is finance and HR from one vendor and then student from another vendor. And there are trade-offs that you will have to face at that time. But the schedule that we've articulated through 2028 will require constant attention to these success factors in order to keep the project on track. So with that schedule, here's a high level estimate for what that initiative uh, could cost. Again, this schedule includes the selection and implementation of software as a service solutions for finance, HR, and student, including payroll and time and attendance. We've assumed median prices for software as a service. Uh, those prices actually can vary pretty widely. So once you know what product you're, you're going with, these numbers are likely to change. We've assumed a mix of 70% external and 30% internal resources on the implementation team. Again, if that mix changes, the, uh, the costs might change. Uh, we've assumed the schedule 
that was outlined on the previous slide. So procurement beginning in 2022 and migration to the system, including the student system in waves through 2028. Even with all of those assumptions, this is still very much a high level estimate. Given the information we have available today, you should think of it as plus or minus 25%. So even though the number at the top there is 235 million, what we're really saying is it's probably somewhere between 180 and 300 million, given that plus or minus 20 to 25% range. Um, I won't go into the details on this. The information is available to the committee. Uh, you have the report but we've broken out that cost estimate by component, including identifying uh, what expenses are capital and which expenses are operating. And we've also broken uh, that out by year so you can understand the financial impact uh, over the course of the project. There are a number of estimating assumptions, which again, are kind of detailed, we won't go into them now, um, but they're there in the report to understand how we came up with the analysis that we've been looking at. So hopefully um, with that material, we've answered the two questions of when will the CUNY first move to the cloud, which is between 2022 and 2028, and how much will it cost, which is somewhere between 180, $300 million. But there are some important next steps that the university needs to look at if you wanna position yourself for success with that schedule and budget. The first is, you know, we've put here, we put forward a, a perspective strategy for your administrative systems that needs to be you know, formally considered and adopted by the university, you know, finalizing the target, doing the financial analysis that will tell you whether or not you can afford the outlay that's articulated here, particularly in the current uh, you know, pandemic environment. Once you've identified that schedule, uh, the time to begin messaging and organizational change, which will require extended effort throughout the duration of the project, assign a project sponsor and an initial team. And the first thing that team will be doing is process simplification and transformation. Because these are activities which, as we've suggested, should not wait for procurement of software as a service solutions to start. So that will involve building a skilled cadre of business process analysts and also providing um, process-related training to the broader uh, university community so that when a process analyst shows up at your office, you understand, you know, the, as a staff member, the staff members understand what that person is doing and can help them most effectively then developing a process inventory and starting to work on the highest priority processes. Again, simplifying them as a precursor to undertaking the effort to move to uh, cloud-based software. While all that is going on, uh, there'll still be continuous improvement with CUNY, CUNY First. Uh, the university should continue to identify and act on uh, high value rapid return opportunities to modify CUNY First and to uh, uh, add point solutions to the CUNY First ecosystem. Also during this time, the university should be looking for process change opportunities that can be used to take complexity out of CUNY first, which will hopefully lower operating costs and will also um, position the CUNY for a smoother, more successful migration to the next generation of software. And I just wanna come back and repeat that regardless of the timing, the work on process simplification uh, and transformation should begin immediately. It is a real prerequisite for the success of any uh, move to the cloud or systems modernization effort. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll say thank you uh, to the committee and, and open it up for questions. Uh, the committee has had uh, about a week to uh, absorb the details. You've received this material uh, as a briefing uh, uh, at home. So uh, are there any questions on this uh, very significant step that the, the university is contemplating taking? Well, first thing, this is Bill Thompson. Let me just thank you, Mr. Chairman, for getting the information in hard copy out to us early. It, it was very helpful and, and create an opportunity to go through earlier. So thank you for that. Um, and just my question is, you've laid out a timetable over, you know, over the next six, seven years. I, and, and you, I mean, basically, that's a realistic timetable. Is there an accelerated timetable that you could talk to or not? Well, there are always ways that an organization can try and accelerate these kinds of projects. Although you do have the external limitation of 
the time it's going to take for the vendors to mature their um, student systems. And I, I want to let Bob speak to that in a second. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what takes time during a project like this is, is understanding the business processes and uh, bringing along uh, the CUNY staff that are going to have to live with and work and effectively use the new system. Uh, it, it is theoretically possible to kind of steamroll through all of that, you know, have a project team that is kind of off to the side and doesn't spend the time working with the university community. You can get done, but it's a high risk approach, uh, really contrary to the way the university has been operating. And it's not something we would recommend. Perhaps Bob, you might take a second and talk to where the market is in terms of the maturation. In, of in the meantime, systems. can you remove the presentation so we can see everybody? Oh, sure. Thank you. Sure. When we when we speak, I mean, given of, of the SIS market, it's a long established market, and these newer SaaS SIS systems have, although they've been in development for some time, say four or five years. Uh, student information systems are very unique. We know that's where we find the most uniqueness and <laughs> for many institutions. And so they're moving and, and learning to build these configurable solutions and ways for people to extend them without um, having to customize and modify architecture and baseline code is taking longer than in some cases anticipated. But the, the value that comes with that is being able to stay on those release cycles, use these configurable solutions in a manner to improve those experience in the delivery and that the technology becomes secondary to the student interaction and the student experience. So instead of spending all that time and effort in, in modifying code to deliver a specific solution or a specific way of doing business, these SaaS solutions enable uh, a different experience, but they're just not as mature right now. So from a feature parity standpoint, um, they're really not capable to give, especially the, the scale and complexity of, a, of an organization like yours, what you're looking for. By 2025, 2026, we expect to see more feature capabilities and functionality available, which would enable you to start down that path if that is, um, you know, uh, as they continue to mature. And we'll see some, some weeding out possibly as well um, with some of the players. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else? Can I follow up on that? Are there any risks if those products take another five years to mature, um, the delay of transitioning over to a SIS through uh, software in the cloud service? Well, I, I from my perspective, no, you're on a very mature, robust system. And as you continue to advance your architecture and platforms and move those systems and, 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 and achieve your CUNY first uh, approach, you'll be able, to, as long as you stay current with the current systems that uh, SIS that you're using, I think be able to have that integrated for a long period of time very successfully. And, and, and in some cases, what we might see is given that all the work and effort that's gone into that and the experience that's been built, organizations might tend to stay with what they're using because of advanced integration and workflow and not be so um, focused on having to switch everything to the same suite at that time. But that, that will play itself out given an, an answer to your question. So knowing what I know about your organization and the planning and the effort that's gone into all of this, I think that there's, um, although there's always risk, I, I, I don't see that as a, as a major risk factor for um, disrupting the, the project. It could extend timelines, that sort of thing, right? But it, overall. Just to be clear, um, until the market is ready, uh, you will still be able to stay on your, your current system because one of the vendors that's trying to get ready is the same vendor that provides your current software. And they're not gonna shut that down until they have something for other folks to move on to. Uh, thank you. Is there anyone else? Well, I have a couple of questions, uh, but I wanna make sure that the committee is, is heard from and has asked their questions. Well, I've, I think I've raised my hand. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, it's Professor Benton. Um, Reading about this and listening to the presentation, there seems to be a value to process simplification. And to the extent that we can identify processes that we could simplify or organize more efficiently, 
and then move our organizational change earlier in the timeline, there would be value in terms of, of how the, the, uh, the rest of the process could work out. Do you have advice for us as to how to go about advancing the process of identifying process simplification and then implementing it? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll offer a couple pieces of advice, Bob, if you wanna add something, go right ahead. Um, it starts with actually having an inventory of your business processes and then deciding which ones are more strategic um, or what we call differentiating. Uh, there's a lot of business processes where it doesn't really matter how you do them. As long as the numbers come out right, it won't change the number of students who choose to attend the university or the number of faculty who want to work at the university. But there are processes that make a difference for those things. And so you want to treat those with higher priority. Um, process analysis is a, and transformation is a discipline. So as we mentioned earlier, you're going to need to start to build up a team of folks who can do this. Um, and who will start by creating that inventory and, and working with uh, institutional leadership to identify those priorities. And at the same time, making sure that the rest of the university understands what process analysis is about so they can contribute and understand how their jobs and how their work efforts, how their work activities uh, could change and be improved. Classically, we see organizations, uh, individuals have kind of a pretty narrow view of what they're working on, right? They tend to think, okay, my job is to get this piece of paper from my desk to the next desk. And part of process thinking is to get them to understand that they're merely a step in you know, getting a student admitted or getting financial aid um, getting, getting financial aid dispersed. And they ought to be focused not on optimizing their particular piece of work, but on helping the university optimize that end-to-end -end process. And so that's, again, something where special skills are needed and broad training is needed. Uh, does that answer the question, Trustee Benton? Professor Bateman? Helpful. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Well, I have a, a couple of uh, quick questions. Um, let me ask first a question that Trustee Cortez Vasquez might appreciate. Um, when we try to keep track of um, of our uh, equal employment opportunity reports with respect to faculty and staff and administration. Um, we typically have to go into the field to fine tune that. Assuming, the question is, assuming that the inputs are right on the ground, will we be able to do that with the proverbial press of a button or flip of a switch? Yeah, I'll start. I think that, uh, Brian, Brian, you could jump in. I think that the upgrade to CUNY FIRTS is going to allow us to be able to do just exactly what you're, 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 you're talking about, uh, Trustee Fair. But Brian, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, thank you, Hector. Uh, yes, I mean, we have those as requirements to sort of build those into the upgrade so that they're, they're easier to pull the data from the system and create the reports for the trustees. And these types of features would have to be identified as far as requirements when we go out to a new for a procurement for a new system. Okay. Um, with respect to procurement, would this make um, a procurement across the university from a, um, a central place more likely and possible? Uh, I guess I want to understand what are your references? The upgrade to CUNY first or? Yeah, the, the upgrades that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'll let Martin jump in, but I, I think that the, the uh, this, this, right now we have put together uh, a couple of sort of end arounds to allow us to be able to track procurement a little bit better. But once we have the e marketplace fully running and uh, we have a couple of other systems fully running, we will be able to um, not only tell at what point we are within a procurement, but also be able to uh, track uh, what's holding up that particular procurement. So the whole university and the whole system will know exactly. Now we don't control what happens after it leaves our office and it, and it goes to the controller's office and goes to the inspector general's office because mm -hmm. they have their own timeline. But 
if we will be able to be able to track that uh, a little bit more. Martin, is there anything you want to add to that, Martin? Uh, 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 yeah, no, uh, thank you, uh, uh, V.C. Batista. Uh, I think you, you kind of uh, addressed all those points, the, the e-procurement marketplace uh, or stuff that we're going to implement, hopefully at the beginning of last year, uh, next year, we're going to kick it off. It's going to address most of those points. The presentation that our uh, folks with uh, Gardner, uh, they uh, referred to integration of the e-procurement platform to the rest of the uh, uh, architecture. Uh, so in a way, procurement would kind of lead this way, and then the rest of the updates would, would come uh, after that. And uh, Trustee Ferrer, I welcome the opportunity to at some point uh, talk about the vision for procurement in front of the committee. Good, but, but all of the details of that, once this new system is up and running, should be incorporated there so that we have a um, pretty much a uniform solution to, uh, to uh, personnel management, to procurement, budgeting and the rest, right? Yes, and phases, but yes, absolutely. If I could just add here, uh, getting you know uh, consistency in those processes is not something that the system can force you to do, and the new technology will not force you to do that either. If you want consistency in business processes, then you've got to make that a specific objective. The, the right. software will help you, but the consistency has to come from a focus on process. I mean, that's I exactly think... correct. But they've got they have to work together, and we have to have a leadership at the university on the trustee level and the chancellery that is totally committed to that aim. Uh, I think that um, we're, we're committed to that end, absolutely, at, at least at our end. Um, one of the things that we're doing, uh, you know, the data is as good as what data we have in there. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we're working on is cleaning up the data and making sure because if you put if you have bad data in, you're going to get bad reports. So we're working on sort of doing some of that cleaning as we sort of migrate to this new upgrade that uh, we're, we're bringing on. So yes, but we're committed. So hopefully we'll, we will count on someone on the, on the board to, to be our partner in this. Is there anyone else? Hey, can I follow up on your question about procurement? So in the presentation, there was a conversation about um, suites of additional software that uh, would be better off to buy as systems, as opposed to one-off pieces for, say, advisement or registrar purposes, or in the case of procurement, which is probably one of these suites. Are, are there currently available suites that work with the underlying um, PeopleSoft software that allow sort of procurement and other things currently available or is that something we're also hoping will be available by the time we are ready to roll it out? I can uh, respond. Um, the procurement that um, the university is doing through um, Martin Sterler um, will interface with CUNY first with the PeopleSoft system and that's part of the original um, requirements so we will build the interfaces to it and the goal was that it would also be able to interface into whatever future systems we may migrate to. So we have thought about the current need as well as the future need of the university with those requirements. Does that answer your question, Professor Bazzani? Yes, thank you. Is there anyone else? Well, I wanna thank um, the committee and uh, for their participation and trust uh, and uh, Gartner for uh, this report. Uh, also our uh, COO, Hector Batista. Um, this was not an easy process to put together. Um, and I for one have been critical at times, partially critical uh, of our system. Um, so to see that we are on the road now to improving this, to bringing it to a place where we can all have confidence in it um, is, uh, is something to celebrate. So um, unless there's anything else, uh, I wanna thank uh, Gartner and uh, EBC Batista for, uh, for this report. And uh, are we ready to move to the fiscal matters information report? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Senior Vice Chancellor, CFO, Matt Sapienza will be uh, providing us further uh, background uh, on the fiscal matters report. Matt? Thank you, Chairman Ferrer, and hello, everyone. Good to see all of you. The fiscal matters report uh, for this month, um, the, the bulk of the information that's on there is a summary of the fiscal year 20 grants that were received by our campuses. Um, we thought that with fiscal year 20 coming to a close, it would be a good opportunity to provide the committee with a summary of the grant activity at each of our campuses. Um, and so we summarize it on the report by the number of grants that each college generated dollar amount that they generated and a couple of sentences for each campus on where the greatest uh, grantor came from for that campus. So the majority of these grants are generated through uh, the federal government, um, also through state and city government, but mostly from the feds um, and are, are maintained and administered through our good colleagues at the CUNY Research Foundation. Um, the total amount, um, if, you, if you look at this report, is about $350 million for fiscal year 20. So the colleges uh, continue to do some good work in generating grants and grant activity for, for research for, for our faculty and students throughout the year. And our three greatest grant uh, generators in terms of campuses were Hunter College, John Jay College, and Queens College, both in the number of grants and in the dollar amounts that were awarded. So. We'll be providing updates um, in fiscal 21 on the grant activity that's happening throughout the colleges. Um, but we thought with the year being over, it would be a good opportunity to provide that information for the, for the entire fiscal year 2020. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee on the information that is presented in this report? I'd like to ask one. Professor Rosani. One thing noticeable in the report, Matt, is the wide variability from campus to campus. And my question is, are there CUNY central efforts to help some campuses that aren't big performers uh, improve in their grant abilities, at, especially with the federal or state level grants? Yeah, um, our Office of Research and, and uh, you know, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Cruz is, is, uh, is on the call, so I'll ask him if he wants to add anything. But our Office of, of Research um, through uh, Tamara Schneider works with all of the campuses directly. Um, as you pointed out, there are some that are really good at, at knowing how to generate grants and, and where those opportunities are. Um, but our Office of Research does coordinate with each of the campuses and we'll ask Executive Vice Chancellor Cruz if he wants to add anything on that. Thank you, Matt. No, I think I think you pretty much summed it up. Uh, our Office of Research, in partnership with the Research Foundation, um, will continue to work on uh, pre-award uh, um, professional development and looking for opportunities for our campuses to uh, be more successful and our faculty to have access to um, the mentorship uh, that will allow to create that pipeline moving forward. Um, I would also say that we're being very intentional, um, and this is something that the Chancellor has um, asked us to do uh, repeatedly um, in, with all of the opportunities that come to Central. So the, our Central Office does receive a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of grants and contracts um, that then we need to partner with campuses on. And so we're being very intentional about making sure that we're spreading the wealth and trying to build capacity in those areas um, that uh, may help us uh, have a more sustainable uh, research and fundraising um, opportunities in the future. Thank you. Let me, uh, Provost, let me ask a, a question uh, further on this. Um, you mentioned the term intentionality, and that's a good thing. Um, are we intending that, um, that people, that individuals on each campus um, be individually mindful or informed of grant opportunities uh, at the federal and state governments or private, re uh, private foundations, or is there a way to advise the campuses of that? Well, um, generally speaking, uh, most of the campuses do a very good job of, uh, through their sponsored uh, grants and programs uh, offices, 
of giving information to their faculty as to uh, where the grant opportunities are. Where we, as many other institutions, need to uh, put more of our effort um, is in making sure that our faculty have the resources they need to be competitive when they apply for, for those grants. Um, and so that's an area where we're looking uh, closely at. Uh, to Matt's uh, previous comments on the work that's happening out of the Office of Research, um, we recently constituted a faculty advisory council of our uh, most um, or some of our most successful uh, researchers and entrepreneurs who will be helping guide uh, our professional development, if you will, in these areas and support services. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If I could just follow up. So there's, to me, there's two types of grants I'm thinking of. One is the research grants that you just spoke to, and the other one is the institutional grants that seem to vary widely. So you know, it's come up on our campus of late, and we've been comparing to Lehman. I noticed Lehman had a $5.8 million grant for some teacher program. And my question is, how can we encourage campuses like the College of Staten Island or others to take advantage of these larger institutional grants and not research grants that rely on, you know, faculty achievement? That's a really good point. And that's a conversation that we have with the um, Council of Provosts, for example, which is um, when you are uh, trying to build capacity in certain areas, uh, inst institutional grants are a good place to do that. Um, and so uh, clearly there's space for our faculty to advance their own disciplines and their own research through individual grants to NSF, NIH, NEH, um, and others. Um, but whenever there's an opportunity to present an institutional uh, grant, uh, particularly through Title V and other such programs that um, we expect once the new administration in Washington comes into place will be more widely available, that that is somewhere, uh, an area where campuses should be looking at um, because that, that brings uh, everybody along and uh, allows not only developing the work that will yield the outcomes for that particular program, but brings together junior, senior uh, researchers as well as staff and students. Thank you. Is there anyone else on, on this question or on the items in this part of the report? If there's nothing else, we have uh, exhausted our agenda. Um, so uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Hearing no objection, we are adjourned. Have a great Thank Thanksgiving, you. everybody.